Thank you for coming to the uh, Fulbright Forum today. Um, today, we have a Fulbright Forum about centering our voices, perspectives on race, equity, and access in Fulbright. Um, our presenters are Alana Diggs, Mecca Slaughter, and Dr. Maria Martin. Um, thank you for attending today. We have a webinar style uh, meeting today. So if you have any questions, there's a Q&A button at the very bottom. Um, we will be taking, we'll, you can provide questions throughout the, the talk, but um, we'll be taking question, the Q&A at the very end. Um, we'll also be doing a couple polls. And so stay, stay tuned. And um, if you'd like in the chat, um, you can communicate with all panelists or all attendees. Um, you can also, if you'd like now, if you'd like to put where you did your Fulbright or where you're located now, you're more than welcome to do that in the chat. Um, but without further ado, um, as a part of the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Maria Martin and to start our talk. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So hopefully you can see that and I'll get started. I'll jump right in. So as Mr. Munir said, uh, we'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of Fulbright forums that will celebrate the 75th year anniversary of the Fulbright program. And today we're gonna be talking to you about an important subject, issues of race, equity, and access in Fulbright programs. So whenever I think about this topic, to borrow from Barack Obama, um, I think about the fierce urgency of now. And this quote from James Baldwin also makes me think about that. It says, um, <clears throat> what is it that you want me to reconcile myself to? You always told me that it takes time. It has taken my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother's and my sister's time my nieces and my nephew's time. How much time do you want for your progress? And so that really makes me think of the urgency with which we need to address issues that can inhibit progress, um, especially you know, to historically disadvantaged people um, in the nation, especially in the context of our nation here in the US. And so today we're going to be focusing on basically issues of equity, access, and trying to create more inclusive, give recommendations to create more inclusive atmospheres um, within Fulbright program. So we're going to do that by sharing our experiences as Black women Fulbrighters at every stage of the uh, Fulbright application process. And also, um, the pre-departure orientation, living abroad, returning home. And we're going to do this to try to offer some recommendations on creating more inclusion um, for all people within the Fulbright program. So today we ask of you as our audience to listen actively. So please pay attention, withhold judgment, and reflect on the things that we're going to say and bring up. And then when you ask questions, when we get to you know, the Q&A, which I'm really looking forward to, um, clarify some of the things that we said um, as well. Um, and then you, know, you can clarify by summarizing what we said and then going into um, either sharing your question or maybe sharing an experience of your own with Fulbright. So I, I really would love to hear from all of you. So in order of um, speakers today, we're gonna have myself, Dr. Maria Martin, a teacher scholar activist at the University of California, Merced in history, critical race and ethnic studies. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Alana Diggs, who is a world traveler um, and an assistant director of alumni relations at the University of Chicago. And then after that, we will hear from Ms. Mecca Slaughter, who is a talented teacher and, in, and a master's in integrated media communications from the University of Nebraska Lincoln and soon to be PhD. So very proud of her. And so I'll jump right into my experience. Honestly, um, in one word, it was transformative. I'm gonna play 30 seconds of a video for you that was made for me by one of my students there. And it, it just really summarizes the energy and uh, what I experienced in Nigeria. It was 
a lituation, I guess you could say. I mean, I really loved my experience there. However, it almost didn't happen. And so I'm going to take you on my journey. Uh, so you can follow along with me on my journey through the different stages of the Fulbright. So before applying, I had no idea at all uh, what a Fulbright was. And so when I came to apply, um, when it came you know, time for me to apply for funding so that I could go abroad and do my research, someone just said, oh, you should apply for the uh, Fulbright. So I looked into the programs, the different programs, and I came across the doctoral dissertation research abroad, uh, the DDRA. So I learned of it very late in my PhD process. And you know, I saw that there was an assumption that we already knew about these things. And so I had no support or direction because I learned of it late. And I didn't have awareness of pivotal information like where the Fulbright coordinator was on campus or what the application process was like or how to write a proposal. So here I was one week from the deadline of the DDRA trying to figure all of this out. So when I reflected on this whole process, I said, well, you know, I would have loved to have known about the program and the resources much earlier so that I could seek mentorship in applying. I think that if I had known even in high school, you know, about Fulbright programs, it, I would have been able to, you know, maybe seek mentorship and be on a better trajectory for applying and winning, you know, um, a Fulbright grant. I did win, you know, the DDRA, but it was a, you know, a difficult and a kind of, um, you know, wonky process for me to try to figure everything out as I was going along. And now even when I was in high school, um, my high school, the high school in my area, we didn't even have books, you know, for the students. So I was actually catching a train and two buses to leave my area to try to go to a high school in a better area. And even at that high school, I didn't hear about Fulbright program. So I think that it would be good to send you know, um, Fulbrighters back into their, Fulbrighters of color, especially back into their communities and support them in talking to high school students and, you know, um, even younger students um, about the Fulbright experiences that they've had. And that will be very helpful. So the next stage is the pre-departure orientation. So I won the DDRA, now I'm going on the pre-departure orientation uh, where they talk to you about, you know, try to prepare you um, for going abroad. So my first impression was that there was a very, very valuable space. I love DC. It was a very, you know, lovely and historic city. And I learned um, a lot of good things in, you know, the pre-departure orientation, such as good travel tips. I forged a lot of connections, which I still have now, like with uh, Mr. Rashawn Allen, who you know, wrote this very lovely uh, family history uh, while he went on his Fulbright to the Caribbean. I met embassy officers uh, like Mr. Clemson, who is you know, at the Nigerian embassy and I still keep in contact with them now. Uh, I also learned how to troubleshoot and I was just edified by the experiences that other Fulbrighters shared. But what I realized as time went on is that I felt otherized, unsupported, and invisible in that space because a lot of I did not see a lot of other Fulbrighters of color uh, in the space, and then also on the um, administrative end, some the Fulbright you know officers, the people who put together the staffers, the people who worked on the pre-departure orientation and put it all together. Uh, there was not a representation of people of color really there uh, too much either. And so one session that I went to on Africa for the Fulbrighters who were going to prepare to go to Africa, there were you know more uh, white people in the room. And so their experiences really eclipsed their concerns and their um, experiences, the things that they wanted to talk about really eclipsed the, the concerns um, and the voices of the people of color in the room. And I was hearing a lot of stereotypical and disparaging commentary about Africa. And it really frustrated and angered the African people that were going on Fulbrights to Africa that were in the room. There was one woman, I remember there was a man who was calling um, African people pygmies and referring to them as living in the bush. 
uh, people were lamenting about taking cold showers and all these kinds of things. And, um, you know, there was one woman who was a black professor who was going to South Africa and she was looking for housing and she found some housing, but her lease was rescinded when the, you know, uh, white property owner Googled her and saw that she was a black professor you know, the property owner rescinded her lease and she was asking, what do I do? I'm leaving soon. I don't have anywhere to stay. And her comments, her concerns were just breezed over. Uh, so, you know, I left that that uh, session feeling very invisible, unsupported. And, you know, the people of color in that session got together and tried to talk to a program officer about what happened and, and offered their help and assistance in building a better and more inclusive session. But that program officer uh, responded in a passive aggressive way and was defensive. And so it was just a very otherizing um, and disparaging experience. Um, and I think things, you know, could be done better there. But yet and still, I went to Nigeria and I loved the whole experience. Um, I had brilliant students and they taught me a more humanistic approach, which I use in my classes now. And my students really adhere to it and love it. Um, I, my Nigerian students were very successful. They all actually won um, praises for our, you know, Institute of African Studies there at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria because of the uh, way that they defended their master's, you know, research proposals. Um, they are, the students also won international fellowships. One of my students who wrote an article in my class published that article in a US journal. Another one of my students won a grant, a research grant for a quarter of a million Naira. And so they were brilliant students, very successful. Um, I love teaching them. And then when I was in Nigeria, I got the chance to go on to a regional travel Fulbright that takes you to another region in, you know, another area in the region that you're in. So since I was in Africa, I was able to go to South Africa. I was in Nigeria. So I was able to go to South Africa and I lectured on my research there. I was very well received. My research on um, non-political activism of Nigerian women nationalists was very well received by the political scientists um, at the University of Pretoria. And while I was in Pretoria, I got to go to Stoweto, one of the townships and talk to youth organizations. Um, I went to Nelson Mandela's home, former home in Soweto. And uh, I got to see much of the city of Pretoria as well. And so um, I did have a lovely experience, but I did experience some challenges when I was there. And this really has to do with intersectionality, uh, being a black woman. So I was affected by race and gender. Now just quickly, uh, I experienced issues of race being a black American in Africa. And this is the perspective that was not brought out at the PDO. Um, you know, I had to explain to people why, what African-American culture is because of the way that the U.S. portrays, misrepresents, and erases, um, you know, Black people. And I had to relive historical trauma, uh, explaining to people why I could not tell them where I'm from in Africa because of slavery and the slave trade. And then there were also effects of colorism, many different ways that, you know, colorism uh, manifests itself in, in these kind of, um, you know, former colonized and, you know, neo-colonial context. And for example, one thing, you know, you might have to do is to watch out for bleaching creams or bleaching ingredients that are in soaps, deodorants, and all of these things. These are things that um, weren't talked about at the PDO perspectives that weren't brought out uh, that I think would have been helpful for me to think about before I arrived. And then I also experienced issues of gender, uh, you know, in Nigeria. So I was accosted by male professors, harassed by men where I live. There were microaggressions. A professor called my students bloody feminists because I was teaching gender studies, uh, gender methods. And um, I had a professor to tell me when I first met him, you know, I didn't know him from Adam. And he asked me if I knew how to greet for sex in their language. And I was like, what, excuse me? And 
because I did not respond to him favorably, he called me difficult. Um, and then there was another professor who we were debating and he didn't like the fact that I got the upper hand on him in the debate. And he turned to the student that I was walking with and asked that student, are you sleeping with this woman? Because she's an evil woman. And, you know, he just went on and tried to, you know, attack my character. It reminds me of some comments about another nasty woman that <laughs> we won't get into. But, um, you know, so these are issues of race and gender and perspectives that I wish we could have talked about during the PDO that would have helped me in preparing to live abroad. But yet and still, I really enjoyed my experience so much so that I had a decision to make about coming back home. Um, you know, they were talking about offering me a position at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, but ultimately I did come back home. However, it was difficult because I experienced depression for a whole month when I came mm. back. And it was because I returned during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I was crushed by the reality that I could no longer normalize the trauma that Black people were experiencing. And so no one really prepared me for returning home um, as a Black American going from one place that, you know, was cultivating and affirming my Blackness to another place where I have to, um, that is, you know, essentially anti-Black. And I was left with this question, what if home doesn't want you? And so, you know, based on my experiences, I would make these recommendations that there should be support for Fulbrighters of Color to go back into their communities and share their experiences on their Fulbright um, and, you know, journey with grade schools and high schools and, you know, just talk about the talk about the transformative and the positive impacts of being on a Fulbright. There should be a mandate and guidance for coordinators at universities and program officers and developers of Fulbright programs like the PDO to encourage and support diverse groups to apply early in their collegiate um, career. And then there should also be, um, you know, space created in Fulbright programs to listen to and to hear from, you know, these Fulbrighters of color. And also, you know, I think that Fulbrighters of color should be asked to help with creating inclusion and compensate them for that work of creating inclusion when, you know, a lot of these programs are being constructed and put together, we are ready, willing and able to help. Um, and then lastly, I think that, you know, connecting, you know, Fulbrighters with resources for the return, maybe having a reorientation would kind of help with coming back into, you know, their uh, home country. So with that, I thank you for listening and I will pass it to Miss Alana Diggs. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Um, it was not lost on me seeing you being carried by those four beautiful men. So thank you for sharing that too, because that was a full on situation. So I'm going to talk about my experience in Andorra, um, which is a very small country in between France and Spain. It is got about, it's fewer than 80,000 people. Um, and unfortunately, because of COVID, I believe that number has significantly decreased. Um, they speak Spanish and Catalan there, as well as French, Portuguese, and then English is their fifth language. And I taught there um, from the ages of about 14 to 16, and I was an ETA. So my grade year was 2018 through 2019, not too long ago. And I wanna preface this by saying that my experience in Andorra was a 10 out of 10. I would recommend it to anybody. I loved my time there. I loved my host family, um, but I also have some experiences I think that other people could benefit from. And uh, I also wanna preface by saying that I do not speak for the entire black community or all women um, or anybody that has gone to Andorra, but I can speak about my experience and what it was like for me to apply there. And so, com arriba means, in, in Catalan means how to arrive. Um, but before we do that, um, I want to introduce you to Holden and Harold. You've probably seen him before. It's a very famous meme. And Harold uh, would like to ask you some questions. 
So uh, I hope you're next to your computers or your laptops or whatever it is, because it's poll time. So we're, I'm gonna ask you a question and just answer it, pretty simple. Okay, the first poll, we'll launch in just a second. First poll is, if you were a Fulbrighter um, and you were a grantee, which region were you in? If you are currently applying, go ahead and put which one you are interested in most. And if you did more than one, just use the one that's most salient to you. And we'll give maybe a couple more seconds on this one. And if you were in the Caribbean, we'll just call that the Americas in this case. Okay, so we have about 30% were in the Americas. Um, the next would be Europe. Um, we had quite a few people in Asia as well. And a lot of people in Africa, not very many people in Oceania and Australia. Okay, next question. What was the determining factor for your choice? Um, as you're going through these, if you have an other, please put that in the chat. I would love to see what else was your determining factor for choosing the location that you chose. We'll probably give another 10 seconds on this one. Someone said they chose Brazil because it was in their research area. That was interesting. Awesome, cool. So we have, most of you actually said, or 30% of you said other. So yes, we'd love to see that chat blow up with um, the reasons for it. Someone said conducting research about uh, the slave trade. That's very interesting. Dissertation research, awesome. Um, a lot of you were interested in a sp specific university or organization. And then last poll question, Why did you tune in today? Is it because you have a shared experience or as a person of color or a woman or a marginalized person, or do you know one of us who's speaking today? Um, you're here to learn more about being anti-racist, or maybe you just wanna be here just because you can't. I'll we'll probably give another 10 more seconds on that. Okay, so a lot of you wanted to learn about how to be anti-racist, which is awesome. I'm so glad that you're here. Some of you are here just because you like Fulbright, or maybe there's another reason. Again, please put that in the chat so we can kind of get to know each other. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons why I chose Andorra, um, and first of all, Harold says thank you. Um, if you don't know who this man is, this uh, like smile that he has is often mistaken for a wince, so it looks like he's holding in a lot of pain. And he's going to come up later um, and he's going to be a bit more relevant to this presentation. Um, but the reason why I asked why you chose which reason you chose is because for me, the first thing that I did when I was choosing places to apply to was country plus racist, country plus black person, because I knew that my skin color and my race and the way I identify and navigate in this world could make me a threat as it does sometimes in, in certain regions in the United States. And not everyone has that experience. So for me, it was really important. And I spent most of my time researching what it was going to be like to live in a country and can I survive there? Um, I also, before we departed, uh, was fingerprinted. I, the pro why that was necessary, I still, to this day, I'm not exactly sure, but I do know that some countries require being fingerprinted which may not sound like much, but to give biographic uh, data to the, to the government can be a pretty 
a difficult experience for some people. Um, it's no secret that relations between the black community and the government are very strained and have been for a very long time. So to be fingerprinted and have to give that data, um, it would have been great to know if there were other options. Is there another way for me to be identified um, so that I could be safe in this country without having to give away such uh, personal information? There was also upfront costs. So when I actually went to Andorra, I had been working for about three years before that. So I had a little nest egg saved up. I graduated from Mizzou. I was working in marketing for a while and then Fulbright called me, uh, not physically, I felt called to apply for Fulbright and uh, to be able to get to the country to do some of the paperwork cost me in total somewhere around $2,000. So a lot of that was reimbursed. Most of it was reimbursed, um, which was awesome. I, I love that. But I also know that there are a lot of people who are straight out of college who can't afford to do that, especially people of color. So my suggestion would be one, to make it more transparent about this process. If you have to be fingerprinted, are there other options? And can we do something to mitigate these costs so that if we are really about decreasing these barriers of entry, cost is one of them. So that means when you're here. Um, so I'll be talking now about what I learned while I was in Dora because I was an ambassador in a country, for a country, for the United States that doesn't necessarily pro proclaim me as American. And here's what I mean by that. When I arrived, I was told that I was expected to look like this woman right here, random stock photo. Um, just typical American is what they said, but instead this is what they got. I am black, I have braids. Um, I wasn't this you know, tall blonde model. Um, so I, the message that is being conveyed to the rest of the world about what America looks like is completely different from who I am. So when you get to this country, you really have to know about yourself so that you can proclaim your American identity and really be an ambassador for a country that doesn't necessarily uh, fight for you. And I put here Cafe Clemeche because I do want to acknowledge also that I do have a lot of privileges. Um, there is a word in Spanish called palanquera, which means a person of like pure African roots. I am not 100% pure African. It's probably my one regret in life. Um, but because of that, I am lighter skinned. Um, I also went to a, a good school that taught me Spanish before I was even able to go to Andorra. Um, I also played soccer, so I was able-bodied, able to take those hills because Andorra has some very, it's very mountainous. Um, so I, I'm able-bodied and I was also able to pay those upfront costs, but no amount of privilege prepared me to be able to see this. Christmas in Europe. Pretty much every country in Europe has something that I would say is traumatic to a, a person of color, um, any, especially black and brown people. Um, during Christmas, the Three Kings, if you know um, a little bit about biblical history, the Three Kings uh, traveled to see Jesus. And one of them, I believe, was Ethiopian, another one from um, somewhere in the Middle East. And so they have different colors and they do try to pay homage to the different races of those kings, but in doing so they do blackface and uh, nothing prepared me for that. I had no idea that was gonna happen and seeing that for the first time was kind of shocking to me. And so as I'm navigating this country and I have coworkers asking me, hey, is it okay to say the N word and just like full on saying it with hard R and everything. Uh, I just wasn't prepared to uh, have to have these kind of traumatic experiences. Um, trauma is genetic. You can genetically inherit trauma. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that later. But uh, so to be years and years, hundreds of years of this history of blackface and oppression and seeing it for the first time um, and Andorra was really difficult. Um, and I also wanna say my experience is not just based off of black people. If you are any, you come from any uh, sort of Asian country, you are just Chino, you are Chinese. 
So if you're Indian or if you are Sri Lankan, they're just gonna call you Chinese, which is also something that is not, um, we weren't prepared for. So, but something that was interesting to me was that everyday people knew how horribly black people were being treated in America. So if someone walked up, sometimes people would walk up to me and say like, how are things? Are you okay? Your country is terribly racist, which while also, you know, having black face. So it's really hard to navigate being an ambassador for a country that uh, doesn't support my um, identity while also having to talk to people about why blackface is really traumatic for me. And so when I return home, Quantonius means when you return, um, the, Dr. Monique Thompson, she's a, a psychologist in the Dallas area. She calls it the black butterfly effect. It's when black women go abroad and they come back and they go into a deep uh, depressive state because they felt a certain type of freedom, no matter how traumatizing their experience might have been, they still felt a type of freedom because people recognize and acknowledge that racism exists in the United States. They recognize it abroad, even if they don't recognize it in their own country. And you come back home and uh, you're faced with the oppression of just being a black person in America. So she dubs it the black butterfly effect. Um, and for me, it would have been, it was a little difficult coming home, but I think it would have been even harder if it weren't for Fulbright Noir, which was a group founded by, I believe four just amazing black goddesses who secured funding for black Fulbrighters in Europe. And I believe in North Africa as well, maybe. Um, to meet up and have our first conference ever in Belgium. And it was just so refreshing to be around black people so we could talk about the experiences that we had. And it was, it was a lifesaver. But Fulbright Noir is not the only one. There's Fulbright Lotus. There's other different uh, groups for marginalized people. And I believe those need more funding uh, because it was difficult for them to get funding for us to go to Belgium and meet up. So the main thing I wanna say is, you know, just don't hold it in like Harold does. If you have difficulty returning back to the United States, find your co cohort, find your tribe, because there are people who are like-minded. And this is the flag, um, the Catalonian flag that is for liberty. And what I mean by that for a little bit of context is up until the 70s, Francisco Franco was a dictator in Spain who did ethnic cleansing, cleansing all over the country. So Catalonians, um, and Andorra is in, Catalo in Catalonia, um, about hundreds of thousands of people were killed and their bodies are still to this day, a lot of them have not been recovered. And instead of um, directly addressing the issue, Spain passed a law called Pact of Forgetting, which basically means let's kind of just move on. We're not gonna address it. We're just gonna go ahead and move on and we're not gonna talk about it anymore. So all of these people who have been through this horrible oppressive time are not being validated. And if that doesn't sound familiar to you, then I would say go back and look at this summer and see just everything about Black Lives Matter because that is a very familiar thing. But there is a huge liberty movement in Catalonia to address these issues, to address the ethnic cleansing. And uh, I believe just about every country has some sort of movement of people who are like-minded, who you can talk to, who you can get involved, um, with because solidarity around the world for all of our um, marginalized identities is very important. And that's something that you can use to your advantage in Fulbright. So here are my recommendations. First, I would say stop requiring upfront costs. Instead of reimbursing, uh, pay for the plane ticket, pay for any of the application fees. Um, and also don't worry about aiming for respectability. There, it's going to be awkward sometimes talking about these things. You're never going to be completely right. Um, you might say it's a couple of things that might offend people, but the idea is that we're learning. Um, so it's not to me awkward at all. If in somewhere on the Fulbright website, I can see that this area is not going to be uh, friendly for people who are in wheelchairs. This area um, still has blackface on Christmas. It, to me, that's helpful. It's not going to step on toes and it shouldn't, and, and um, it's not offensive to me because it's helpful. 
So talking about race is not bad. It's actually very helpful in this case. I would also say to continue um, to fund groups like Fulbright Noir and Fulbright Lotus, the groups that are doing the work to create safe spaces and to uh, ramp up reentry resources like uh, helping with finding jobs and um, panels like these and scholarships, giving us these opportunities to get reintegrated back into society. Um, and Mecca is going to talk about this in a bit, but I'm just going to say have like-minded counselors, and I'm just going to leave that to Mecca to talk more about. And then I would also say start a mentorship program. Um, at University of Chicago, we have this awesome navigator program where new people are matched with people who have already been in your shoes. And I would have loved to have been matched with someone who went to Endor to talk about what it was like there. More transparency in the process um, and also understanding these power structures. What is a Fulbright post versus a Fulbright commission? What is IE? Who can I talk to about this issue? Who can I talk to about that issue? And then I also say have a database of facts. Like I said, you know, Christmas time, you might see um, a traditional attire that looks like a KKK hood, which is a real thing. You can look that up in, in Spain um, it, and a lot of Mediterranean countries. Um, that's part of their um, relig religious regalia. And lastly, I would say history and cultural training for ETAs because it is really important that when we're talking about American history and American identity, that we're not just talking about mainstream or white culture, that we're talking about all cultures. And please, if you have any questions, I'm so happy to answer them. But with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Mecca to talk about her experience in Eastern Europe versus my experience in Western Europe. Thanks. You're muted. I am now unmuted. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm just over here talking. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna share my screen here and we're gonna get started. Um, like I was introduced, my name is Mecca. Um, I graduated from University of Nebraska-Lincoln um, with a master's in integrated media communications. Um, and I served um, in 18 backslash 19 in what is now called North Macedonia. Um, they went through a name change um, in the middle of my time there. So my presentation, my voice, um, so we'll just get started here. So I'll be talking about my application process, my time abroad, and my return back home to the United States of America. All right, so um, I have some pictures, you know, for some fun times. Um, so we'll just start. So I did not know what Fulbright was. Um, I was in um, my second to last semester of my grad program and I had no idea what Fulbright was. I also had no idea what I was gonna do after grad school. Um, and someone in my scholarship program from undergrad said, hey, you should do a Fulbright. And I said, what is a, what is a Fulbright? Um, and so she was like, you need to go talk to this person. All right. And so the advisor on my campus for the Fulbright program, um, her office was in the Honors College. Um, and so it's like a, a separate dorm for the honor students. And so if you weren't in that dorm, you probably didn't know who she was or, you know, where her office was located. We'll talk about that later. Um, and so I set up a meeting with her and I went um, and while I was waiting, there was a wall of pictures. Um, and it was everyone that had received a Fulbright since she had been advisor through the University of Nebraska system. Um, and I saw no one that looks like me. And I said, all right, we need to do something about this. Um, and I went into her office and she said, you know what, Mecca, it's due at the end of the month. So I found out about Fulbright four weeks before the application was due. And I was like, all right, we got to get started. Um, and so I talk about not knowing about Fulbright and the neglect of multicultural organizations. I remember going to the pre-departure orientation um, and someone else from my university uh, um, was talking to me about his experience and how he applied. Um, and he said that the advisor specifically went to his um, organization. It was like Russian club or something like that um, to talk about Fulbright. And I said, wow, the multicultural center was probably five steps from the honors college. And I said, she was able to go to um, cross campus to a meeting to present about Fulbright, but couldn't even drop off you know, pamphlets or anything at the Multicultural Center um, 
right next door. And so that kind of frustrated me. And so we'll get to that in my recommendations at the end of what we can do about that. Um, and then the sea of red, I remember giving her my um, application and my personal statement and everything for her to go over. And she gave it back to me with a bunch of red marks on it. And I, at first I felt really defeated. And I was like, I, why, why am I even continuing to do this? Um, and that's when my passion and persistence over prejudice comes out. I decided that I was just going to turn it in the way I felt it needed to be turned in. She told me that the Fulbright Association won't like what you wrote. Um, it's not what they're looking for. It's not academic enough. Um, you're not going to do well. Um, come to find that more, I'm talking about Fulbright experience, right? So they must have liked something in my essay, right? Um, but I think all I did was change a couple of commas and periods um, for grammar purposes and turned it in. Um, and then we come to the next page and it's my acceptance letter, woo! So I got this email and I did scream a little bit louder than I just did um, receiving it. Um, and so it was actually, hair flip, it was actually my moment in black history because on my campus, I was the first um, African-American female student. There was a professor that had gotten it before but I was the first African-American female student to receive the Fulbright uh, through the University of Nebraska system, which includes Univer University of Nebraska, Omaha, Lincoln, and Kearney. Um, so three different universities and I was the first and this was 2018. So um, after this and after, you know, um, the university sharing the news and things like that, I had so many young black men and women coming up to me asking me, how did you do this? How is this possible? Um, because when they found out that the advisor's office was in the Honors College, they thought you had to have like a 4.0 GPA, be perfect on everything, um, you know, involved in everything. And I was like, I didn't have a 4.0 GPA. I was just passionate about what I wanted to go and do um, overseas. And I wrote about that and that's how I um, achieved this. And when they heard that, they're like, oh, well then I definitely can do something like that. So um, this place in Black history. It's really weird because that was 2018 and, you know, first are still happening, but uh, it was very important. Um, and so I have um, false impressions, racism dipped in sugar. So now we've kind of moved over to um, from pre departure and applying to my time actually in um, now North Macedonia. Um, I decided to create a blog of my experience. Um, after the first couple of weeks, I was like, I need to write this down because <laughs> no one is going to believe me if I just, you know, say it. So I have to write it down. Um, and I started Mecca's Macedonian Adventure. Um, and I was, you know, just typing and typing away. And there was a point um, in my time there that I had no drive uh, to even write or type anymore. Um, my um, bachelor's is in journalism. And so I'm, you know, used to writing and um, things like that. So it was easy for me, but then I had this like drought of not wanting to write. And so I have a little snippet um, of my time there um, and things like that. And I'll, well, I'll just see. Um, I was like, the drive to write was honestly has left. Um, I remember the past few weeks, sadly, I could only recall the bad things that have happened. Um, I don't see it as a negative, um, but it's reality. Um, sometimes I feel people don't understand the weight um, of negative influence have on my mental health. Um, people have told me, oh, it's gonna be okay, or just don't listen to what you know people are saying. Um, okay, thanks, but until you get laughed at every day, called the N-word when you are trying to catch a taxi and get your hair pulled, um, or have to make sure you're in a house before dark because you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't have the right to tell me what's going to, it's going to be okay. Um, and so that was a part of my experience. Um, being over, um, being over in North Macedonia. Um, and so that's actually the link on top of the page was what I just read, um, but my core. So I always want to tell people that my university experience there was awesome. So I was an ETA and I taught at a couple of universities um, there in North Macedonia um, as a professor. And I helped out with, you know, film club and other things like that as well. Um, but my time there with, you know, the students was awesome. And I met some really great professors while I was over there. Um, and the young ladies down at the bottom corner of the screen, um, they were in the Peace Corps while I was there. And so it was really, um, great to meet them and you know great to develop these relationships with um other you know young women that look like me um and i have a picture of this uh coffee shop here it was called brown sugar and that was really the only reason i went to that coffee shop because it's called brown sugar um 
but my university experience there was amazing. And um, to go back and to teach um, at the university level uh, would be, you know, awesome. And I wouldn't mind going back to do that. Um, it was that social side that was kind of it. Um, and so my return, <clears throat> and so I talk about PTSD and how it's real and how we need to address it. Um, upon my return, a quick little snippet about two or three weeks after I came back to the States, my friends took me out, we went out, woo, 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 had all this fun, um, and we went into this venue. And as we're entering, I'm hearing like people laughing and talking and then I didn't, I don't know who these people are, um, but I started to have like little panic attacks and I started like hyperventilating and getting like really freaked out and nervous. And my friends were like, it's time to go home. Um, and now it's because I was used to, whenever I heard laughing overseas, it was people pointing at me and people laughing at me and people um, calling me out of my name and making jokes and things. And so I had to immediately, um, get um you know help for that as soon as I came back because I was teaching in the classroom and I you know thought to myself I can't you know be an effective teacher if my students are you know had made a joke or something and start laughing and I, I can't have like a panic attack in the middle of teaching you know um and so PTSD is real and uh, we need to address it as you know Fulbright um to our students that may experience some of these traumatic experiences um, and then using my Fulbright to its advantage. Um, when I returned home, I had no idea how to put Fulbright on my resume and how to effectively use it. Um, so we'll talk about that in the recommendations. Um, but I mean, I got the certificate said, yeah, you completed the program, everything. And I was like, what do I do with this? This is nice, I can frame it. And my mom put it on her refrigerator, but what, what really am I going to do with this, right? Um, so I was kind of stuck in this stage of limbo. Like, what am I going to do now? Um, currently, I am <laughs> getting ready to start, um, you know, my um, PhD, and I'm a full-time mom to a set of twins. But other than that, it's like, I'm, I'm in limbo. What am I going to do with my Fulbright experience, and how can I positively use what happened to me over here in the States? <laughs> Um, so my recommendations. This is a group. Um, Alana mentioned uh, Fulbright Noir. Um, I was going to wear my t-shirt, but I thought maybe I should dress up a little bit, um, which was a great experience. Um, and some of these young people, um, young men and women, um, they I had met them through Fulbright Noir. We were able to chat and talk um, and things like that. They were all in different countries. And so it was just nice to know that there was someone else out there um, overseas um, in Eastern Europe that I could like message real quick and be like, okay, girl, what happened today? <laughs> because I need to, I need to, I need to talk it out with somebody. Let's go over these um, recommendations. So market outside of the advisors on every campus, especially after what happened last summer on every campus, they are now putting people in like diversity inclusion, um, vice chancellors or, um, directors of multicultural centers. So there are people on campus that can reach are students of color, no matter what color they may be, right? Um, we need to reach those people. We need to reach out and we need to grab them and we need to give them this information about Fulbright. Um, because like I said, the advisor that I had, her office was in a place where not a lot of people were passing or going and didn't even know she was there. So it's important to reach out of the, reach outside of those advisors and grab hold onto these people that have that reach to our students of color as well. Um, having a return orientation. So when you come back, I know Dr. Martin talked about um, how when, you know, her experience coming back and then Alana talked about, you know, that, you know, that butterfly um, effect, you know, so um, that return orientation could really help and could really, you know, help us as returning Fulbrighters. Okay, what happened? Um, what can we do? That's when we can add in how to use your Fulbright experience um, effectively and get, you know, the position or job that you want, things like that. Um, offering diverse counseling services. So a little snippet, uh, when I was overseas, it was about, um, about the time I had written that um, snippet that I had read to you all, um, Fulbright was able to get me a counselor while I was you know, overseas in, Mas in North Macedonia. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna try it out, I'm gonna see. So this man, he emails me and he's like, okay, Fulbright sent me to you, I'm gonna help you. I'm like, great, awesome, cool beans. Um, we do the little Skype, now we're on Zoom, but we did Skype back then, um, and 
he was in his late fifties, early sixties, white man. And I was telling him about my experiences and like, oh my gosh, I'm scared. I'm nervous. I'm afraid for my life. And he's like, you know what? I understand because when my family and I went to Africa for a week or a vacation, we were pointed at too. And I was like, hmm, you're comparing your vacation to what my life, to my life for the next nine months. That doesn't correlate for me. Um, and so I was like, do you really understand what I'm going through? I'm afraid for my life. And you're telling me, but your family got pointed at while you were on vacation. That doesn't correlate for me. And so having those diverse counseling services um, would be very effective for our students of color who are going overseas um, to have someone to talk to um, either, you know, back in the States within Fulbright or maybe Fulbright's partnering with um, counseling services in the States to be able to talk with our students. Um, and don't sugarcoat the Black experience. Um, I always tell people I wanted to go to Macedonia. I was ready. I read the description. I was like, okay, I can go there. I'm pretty sure there's not going to be a lot of Black people. I'm okay with that. Let's go. I'm from Nebraska. I'm used to it, right? Um, but don't sugarcoat it. Let me know so I can fully prepare myself. Um, you give me the resources. Hey, Mecca, if this happens, call this person or message this person. Hey, you know, if this happens, call this person. I um, compare it to when you're taking a kid to school for the first time. Um, they may be scared. Yes. But hey, if something happens, you tell your teacher. If something else happens, tell the principal. Tell, you know, another adult, you know, something like that. So don't sugarcoat that Black experience. Um, be upfront about it and let us know. Um, because it's different than when I just showed up there and didn't eat for the first two weeks because I was scared to go outside, right? So don't sugarcoat that experience for us. And equip the U.S. embassies with proper resources. Um, so my U.S. embassy was really not a lot of help. Um, I got more help from the commission in Bulgaria, which was the country next door, than I did from my own U.S. embassy in North Macedonia. Um, I talk about the time where one of the young ladies in my cohort, she made a comment and said, if Mecca didn't act so black, then these things wouldn't happen to her. And my embassy did nothing about that. They didn't address it. And I was like, what? Um, and the incident that she was talking about was because of the way like I laughed one time when we were all out. And I was like, so the way I laughed has more precedence on who I am, not my degrees, not my experience, not, you know, all these things, but the way I laughed. And the embassy was no help. Um, and so we need to make sure that Fulbright and those U.S. embassies overseas are like clinched, like this is the information you need. Um, and then utilizing past recipients for pre-departure orientation. I think it was, you know, mentioned um, before about that um, because we have stories. We have, we have things that we can share to help the students that are going over, right? Um, and I am always open. And I told, um, I remember telling my US Embassy on the last day that I was there, I said, I am a resource. I, I, if someone needs to call me, they can call me. They need to email me while they're here, they can email me. I will wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning to make sure that the experience that happened to me doesn't happen to anybody else. Because now that Fulbright knows these experiences that we as students of color experienced, there should be a change and there should be a movement to make it better for that next generation that's going overseas. Um, if it clicks, oh, there it goes. Um, so thank you. Uh, my website um, is there. Um, and then you can always email me or message me on Instagram, post to my best week. So thank you so much. I'll stop my share. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, you know, thank you for all to all of the panelists. Oh, let me turn my camera on. <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Mecca and Alana. Thank you for Fulbright for you know providing this space for us. And we've talked about again issues of access and equity and also race in Fulbright programs and also throughout the different stages of applying to and getting ready to go on and even returning from a Fulbright grant. And so, you know, um, as they say in Nigeria, no vex now, <laughs> no ahala, don't stress, don't vex, 
you know, we're going to have a little bit of time for, um, you know, some conversation. I would really love to hear what people are saying, what people, you know, what kind of questions, what kind of thoughts come into your mind. Uh, so if you, you know, definitely have time to stick around, please do that. So we want to devote um, a little bit of time to that conversation. So please go ahead and, you know, put any of your questions in um, the Q&A section. We might be able to catch them if they're in the chat, but you know, everybody's uh, questions are kind of, you know, bunched up together in the chat, but they're uh, more readily available in the Q&A. So if you have any questions, please put them there. All right, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the panelists some questions. Uh, Mecca, Alana, if you'd like to turn your video on, um, you might all have input on some of these questions, but the first one um, is, I think, for everyone. Um, obviously, thanking you for the presentation, which has been quite insightful and quite a great uh, perspective on the Fulbright program. And um, they say some other countries may see racism and Black Lives Matter as something that is only relevant for the U.S. Um, but in a general sense, how can we expand these conversations about Black or persons of color in general? to experiences to include a global audience. Um, alongside this, what can the international perspective add to these discussions in the US? And would love to hear all three of you um, speak about this or anyone who's passionate. Yeah, um, I definitely could speak to this because in the session, for example, that I noted um, that I went into uh, that was a part of that pre-departure orientation uh, in DC, there were different groups, you know, there were um, Latinx folks, African folks, African American, you know, that were there. And um, there were people who, you know, kind of were from diverse backgrounds and represented other countries, but they were coming from the US and going to uh, these different places on their Fulbright journeys. And when they did, I mean, it got to a point where it was so um, you know, disrespectful and uncomfortable in that session, the things that were being said that uh, these other folks started to come and speak out about, you know, speak out against the things that were being said and try to bring different perspectives. And it was extremely helpful because if we are in this space and people who are otherwise well-meaning are saying things that are disparaging, they need to be challenged. Because if we don't challenge those ideas, they'll just be there um, unchecked. And so the people's voices who were originally from abroad, uh, from you know, Latinx countries, from African countries, when they started to speak up and they started to you know, um, talk, speak against some of the things that were being said, there was an enlightening uh, moment. You know, there was a, a moment for education um, you know, that existed, that was created in that space. Now, it was up to the other people whether they wanted to learn from those perspectives or not. But yeah, I mean, I think that those voices and those perspectives are extremely valuable uh, because they can help us to create, you know, the inclusive atmosphere that we are striving for. Um, and if you guys have other comments, let me know. Otherwise, I'll, I'll go to the next question. Um, the uh, Would you still consider uh, or say that the countries that you did the Fulbright in have a special place in your heart? Did the good outweigh the bad? And if you had the chance to do it over again, would you still choose that country? I'll speak on this and I'm sure Mecca, you have something to say too. Um, I would say that they come together um, Maya Angelou said something that was like, you can't take the, you can't take the good and leave the bad and you can't leave the bad and take the good. They're just one thing. Um, so even with that being said, I absolutely love my country and I would definitely go back and knowing everything I knew. I just wish I was a bit more prepared to see what I saw. And I wish that we had spent more time um, talking about different cultures in America so that I knew that um, our counterparts who were also teaching in different schools I could trust that um, they were talking about an, Ameri an America that was inclusive of my experience as well. So 
um, yeah, I would, I would definitely recommend it. And I think the experience is worth it. Um, I, in many cases, I think that life in America can prepare you um, for dealing with some racist aspects abroad as well. Yeah, I would. I would agree. I would, I'm writing on my notepad, y'all. <laughs> I'm getting a little old, so I got to write everything down. But um, yes, no, North Macedonia definitely has a special place in my heart. I met so many great, um, like I said, professors, um, the young ladies and like the Peace Corps that I met there. Um, if it wasn't for me going to Macedonia, I would have never, you know, met people in the Fulbright and I would never, you know, never met a lot. You know, it's like, like Alana was saying, like, it comes together, the good and the bad. Yes, those horrible things may have happened to me, but um, I mean, we, I even started like a, a Facebook group in Macedonia called, you know, um, it was like the Black Girls of Skopje or, you know, um, and it's still going strong. So, you know, it's, um, I will never lose those connections with, you know, the other people, the people that I've met there. And so, I, I mean, I told one girl, I was like, I'll come back, you know, when your child graduates high school her child's five right now. So I have some time. And so it's, <laughs> you know, so um, I will like Macedonia will always hold a place in my heart. Most definitely. I'd go back. Yeah, I definitely um, would go back to Nigeria. I actually, I've been back every year since, <laughs> since then, um, really, uh, well, since, you know, I became a professor at the University of California, I've been going back and maintaining my networks. I've been also working on grants with the gender studies director where I was teaching um, in Nigeria. And I still mentor students from there. One of the students is coming, you know, just applied to come to the University of California. She's coming here. Uh, so I keep my connections. I also, you know, the political scientists at the University of Pretoria, South Africa, just, you know, invited me to um, a conference. They're starting up a new political, African political science, you know, association, and they want me to present on my research there. And um, so, yeah, I mean, and I also presented in Kenya and talked to, you know, activists who were engaged by my theoretical development there. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely love going to the continent and I definitely will always go back to Nigeria. Um, Alana, I think a couple people had questions about the black butterfly effect. Could you put that in the, the chat and just make sure you put all attendees and all panelists so everybody can see that link. Um, the other, another question is, um, what topics are some topics you would cover if you could do the reorientation program? Yeah, um, I think that there should first of all be a debrief of experiences that people have had. And then that would be followed by having, you know, culturally affirming spaces and conversations. And then we could also follow that by um, either, you know, work with a therapist or someone or a professional who could focus on, you know, achieving healing activities, you know, putting together healing activities that are, you know, mentally and emotionally, um, you know, responsive. And then also to, focus on method, learning methods of resiliency. So I think that those are some things that a, a reorientation um, could entail. And, and definitely you would wanna talk about whatever has been happening in your home country since you've been gone. So that it's not such a shock when you get back. I also, I had a Fulbright post. So it was not, I didn't have a commission, meaning that my Fulbright go-to person was actually an enduring government uh, worker. So I did not have Fulbright employees in my country. I think that might've changed my experience because we didn't have a pre-departure, we didn't have a return, um, none of that. So mm -hmm. to me, I just came home and I just came home. Um, if I happened to see an email from Fulbright saying, hey, sign up for this thing, I could do that. But um, it seems to me that um, other experience, other people have experienced being more plugged into the Fulbright community um, than I might have had. So I would say just making those resources very obvious. I saw someone put in the chat that there is um, reintegration training um, and to be on the lookout for that. That's awesome. Love that. And I would love that in conjunction with maybe some sort of alumni cohort thing. I know that there are chapters in different parts of the country but personally, um, I, th those resources 
were not necessarily made obvious to me. Um, so I would just say make it very obvious. I think your camera's frozen. I think we might have lost Alana for just a second. Um, yeah, I saw that there was a question about alumni and alumni group for um, you know people of color, for Black and Indigenous people of color, Fulbright. I do know on Instagram, you know, there's a lot of different um, Fulbright groups, and I know that Fulbright Noir is there. Um, there's also Fulbright Latinx, Fulbright Prism, you know, there's different groups that you can find there um, on Instagram. So that might be a place that you can, some names that you could start with. Um, yeah, I saw that question too. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm plugged in with Fulbright Noir because I mean, I love them. But um, I do, I would suggest maybe having like an alumni group because um, with um, all the ones that you had mentioned, it's like a mixture of everybody. And so maybe there could be like an alumni group that um, like one of our purposes is to um, disseminate that information about Fulbright to these universities or, you know, I don't know. But um, yeah, and I think one of my suggestions was just to, like Alana said, that communication, making these things obvious. Um, and like, and just like her, I, I had a post, I just had a U.S. embassy. I didn't have a commission. So it was like someone's job at the embassy just to like, make sure we were okay, you know? And, um, I think there needs to be that like communication, like, cause like she said, I came back and I was just like, all right, I'm back home. I got to move all my stuff out and, you know, drive back to Nebraska. So, you know, it's, um, there was really nothing there. And so, um, yeah, that's my suggestion. Mm -hmm. And I would like to also, you know, add, um, you know, to the question about how Black experiences, you know, in a global context can add to this conversation. Um, I think that in, in, you know, global peoples of color in general, I think that it would be extremely important for all of those voices to be heard so that we could realize these aren't just U.S specific, you know, issues. These are issues that affect, you know, global populations that affect people in many different contexts, especially in contexts that have been formally colonized. Um, you know, so all of these issues of race, access, equity, gender, you know, um, colorism, all of these things are experienced by people in all of these different areas. And I think that it's important to create spaces where they feel heard um, to also invite them in when we're, you know, constructing these different programs, the pre-departure or the reorientation or whatever it might be, and to compensate them for that work <laughs> as well. And I think that, yeah, we can bring about a more, um, you know, more connectivity in addressing these issues if we are making sure that there are global voices, um, you know, that are heard. So I wanted to say that. Uh, we have another good question. Um, presumably there are also members of other racial or ethnic groups in your Fulbright cohort. To what extent do you feel you had the same experience and what ways do you think the experience diverged? Um, well, oh, go ahead, Dr. Oh, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, I told y'all about my little story, but um, my experience from the um, other um, young people in my cohort um, just for Macedonia was extremely different. Nothing was similar. Probably the only similar thing was um, we all got on a plane and landed there, you know, um, but it was extremely different. I had people in my cohort, um, one young man um, had family, no, two of them, two young men had family in Macedonia. So they were part Macedonian. And so their experience was way different because one, they were a male and two, they could speak the language very well. Yeah, um, so it was it was really difficult because at a certain point I knew um, that I could not depend on the other people in my cohort. I just couldn't. I if I if I was in trouble, I just I could not um, because of that one comment that young lady had made. And so um, it was very different. 
um, and I depended more on the, um, I meant, uh, like I said, I had a Facebook group of Black women in Macedonia. I depended more on them than my cohort, people that, you know, I met before and we came over together. So it was um, very different. And I have, it was really sad, <laughs> you know, that you can't depend on these people that you came over with you, um, you know, in your time of need or anything like that. And so I, um, I would, I was like, when I was over there, I was like, I wish Fulbright would do like a background check on these people because, ah, this is crazy and ridiculous. Um, and so uh, it was very different and it was, um, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, but that was my experience. It was very different from my other people in the cohort. And I had my own, you know, I was like in my own world at that point. Well, to Mecca, to that point, I think it would be really great if one of the short answer questions for Fulbright was about, um, you know, how, right, just D and I, just one question even just to ask, to, to, to ensure that we're all thinking globally um, in terms of race and inclusion. Uh, my cohort was pretty diverse. Um, and I would say that my experience being black in Western Europe, like I said, everyone thought of America as, um, <laughs> I, I kept hearing that America is a pretty racist country. Um, so it's not that they weren't completely unaware of what was going on in the United States, but a lot of people didn't realize that their countries also in some ways perpetuate racism. Uh, pretty much every place in the world does. So, um, there was some solidarity that I could find in Andorra. I would say that my Asian counterparts felt very targeted, um, mm -hmm. not being considered beautiful, always being called Chinese rather than whatever um, uh, country in Asia they they belong to. So um, I would say there was some solidarity, but I do think that most of my cohort noticed and felt othered as well. So I was not alone in that. Yeah, and for me, um, you know, I've had several different experiences. I've been abroad with the Fulbright, uh, different Fulbright programs several times. And so I, you know, went for teaching with the most recent one. Before that, I went on the DDRA. And so that they were more independent. Um, I didn't go with a group or anything like that. But the first, the very first one that I did, I went with a group. Um, and it was a language and cultural immersion uh, type of program, uh, you know, where I learned the Yoruba language uh, in Southwest Nigeria. And when I went on that, we did, oh, I had issues. I had issues with, uh, especially one young woman from Chile and she would ask me in class if I could make my buttocks move and isolate and dance with them like the black women on the music videos. And, um, you know, and the teacher got mad at me for, you know, uh, disliking the question and, you know, telling her that that's not an appropriate question. And so the teachers need to I think um, in some of these programs and, you know, the people who are putting things together, even though that, you know, uh, language program was not directly a Fulbright program, but it was being funded by Fulbright. I think that, you know, um, in any of the things that we do in going abroad and the people who are uh, training us and going with us, there needs to be conversations. We just need to have open and honest conversations about ideals, about what people think and how to challenge those ideals in healthy ways. We just need to create spaces to challenge those ideas in healthy ways. And so, um, you know, when I went abroad with her and also another, um, you know, girl that was in the cohort, she said, you know, I'm not here um, for anything other than the Fulbright name. This, this uh, language is useless. Yoruba is useless to me, um, you know, because I'm never going to, I'm going to go back to New York and I'm never going to use this again. And so again, just very disrespectful. She was very disrespectful to the Nigerian people that were teaching us and hosting us. Um, yeah. And, but then I also did have other Black individuals from the Caribbean, you know, then also African-American individuals who were on that uh, particular Fulbright group. 
and they were, you know, they could understand some of the issues that we experience uh, as Black Fulbrighters, but then there was still another level of issues even among them because of things that they had been taught about Africa before we, you know, went there. Um, you know, so we, we have to deconstruct these negative images and also create spaces where we can have, um, you know, healthy conversations that challenge a lot of these different ideas and images of other people. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to end it here. Um, I know that some of you have put your contact information in the chat. Um, if you haven't already, go ahead and do that so anyone can get in touch with you. Um, this uh, webinar will be made as a YouTube video, a recording, um, and it will be made available online. Um, I'd like to air clap or digital clap for the presenters. It was quite an excellent thing. I know you're on the webinar, we can't hear you, but we know you're clapping. Um, and yeah, I'm going to just show you the next upcoming uh, Fulbright forums and thank a uh, special thanks to our members and donors who make all of our programming possible. Um, our next Fulbright forum is on March 4th, um, great decisions and about globalization. And then the next one is on March 16th, which is about dance and the dance scholarship. You can see all of our events at fulbright.org slash calendar. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, thanks for being with us. And thank you for uh, the presenters for offering this space to our community to discuss and to talk about extremely important and timely things, especially being Black History Month. This is the perfect time for it. And um, if you have other questions, you can email us at info, uh, info at fulbright.org if your answer wasn't, your question wasn't answered yet. Um, but yes, thank you so much and uh, have an excellent day.